You're watching Nice Behind the Scenes, a space for conversation about community, collaboration, and the future of journalism. Um, this week marks the one year mark of Matter Na at WHYY. And I just got to ask you, and I'm judging by the smile on your face, <laughs> you're really proud of this. What does this mean to you? Um, like Biggie said, you know, it was all a dream, you know, <laughs> it started as all a dream. Um, it, it feels amazing, you know, when I actually, and the, and the best part about social media is that they remind you things. So, uh, social media actually reminded me, Hey, coming up is your one year anniversary from this particular post. And I was blown away. Um, so when the, the year just came to it, it, it's closing as far as just the first year, um, I'm just truly excited to be a part of WHYY. I'm a part of, excited to be a part of NICE. Um, this is definitely an initiative that is pushing the uh, mission and the objectives of what Revive is about in its entirety. To be a part of something like this, you know, as it's kicking off, um, mm -hmm. it's amazing. And to be one year in is even more amazing, you know? So um, I'm just truly excited. Take our audience through what the process was like, even getting Matt or Not on the radio, like the pitch process, the the internal thinking, like how you decided what was going to be your first episode, like peel back the, the curtain a little bit for us. I got you. Um, Matter Knob was birthed, uh, sadly to say, after the passing of George Floyd, uh, the mm. incident that took place in 2020, uh, when Black Lives Matter and protesters and, and, you know, people of rage just really hit the streets of Philadelphia, not just Philadelphia, but cities everywhere here in America. And um, I seen the rage, I seen the anger, I seen the frustration from community members, but we wasn't talking about that. You know, we were only talking about uh, Black Lives Matter as an organization, or we were just talking about solutions as a whole, but the solutions come from feelings and emotions. And in order to get to those solutions, you gotta identify what those feelings and emotions are. So that's truly where Matter Not came from, you know, walking around the streets of Philadelphia, asking people like, are you mad or not? <laughs> and come to find out they were really mad, but they were mad with a reasoning behind it. They, were, they weren't just mad just because their streets were being burnt down or, you know, they seen protesters hitting the street. They were mad because, you know, elected officials may could have stepped in. They were mad because police officers could have did more of their jobs. So there were, you know, reasonings behind them being mad and those reasonings need to be heard. So WHYY, uh, they loved it. <laughs> so that's how it got picked up. But at the the initial pitch, you know, um, coming from an independent side and collaborating and partnering with someone like WHYY, you feel as though that you need to bring that same energy and you need to bring that same glit, right? Glitz and glamour. So, you know, me being a little rough and edgy, I didn't think that that was going to be selling in a market like WHYY. So when Chris first reached out, he was like, yo, I love this, this, this pitch, this matter or not uh, idea. But when it came down to sitting with uh, Sandy and John, I went with something completely different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I, I just thought that that's what the market, you know, was looking for. But really what the market was looking for was the edginess, was the, you know, energy of someone who can really bring that raw content. Um, so that's another a story that I always tell when it comes down to, you know, really getting mad or not off on the air. So uh, just being myself really, yeah. being myself really got me this opportunity. Now yeah, shout out to <laughs> shout out to Sandy Clark because that's who POC is with. Sandy Clark, who's WHY's VP of News, and John Musoni, who's our audio general manager. Uh, Eric, you know anything you want to you want to in? I, I know that you've often heard with with people at Nice where they think that they got to switch something up, you know, and and not necessarily be their authentic selves. But it was the authentic selves that got POC on the air. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. I, I'm interested POC in your approach to people on the street, right? Like this mm -hmm. is Philly. Um, even though I know you're not originally from Philly, but we all know we all know what it's like to walk up to people <laughs> in the street. The grit, like, what is it like when you approach folks on the street and you want to ask them that question? How do you how do you even start that conversation? That's a good question. That is a really good question. And shout out to Flood the Drummer. Shout out to Chris, Chris Norris. He really um, helped me as far as just throwing little tidbits and advice out there. Um, so when I first started, it was it was it was I would say. A little bit easier because I wasn't asking for personal information. I was just asking for their answers. Like, are you mad or not? What are you mad about? So people will talk all day about why they're mad. But when it involves like a name or a part of the city you're referencing, uh, it, it 
details a little bit more information and co uh, conversation that I have to have prior to the actual start. So taking Chris advice and then also knowing the type of people that live in Philadelphia, I combined it that and I introduced myself first. I combined it that and I came off like, yo, you see that over there? What you think about that? Before I would even, you know, pull out the mic or even say, hey, my name is and I'm here for this, that and the third. So just starting natural organic conversations and being a part of the community conversations before I'm saying, hey, can we take this community conversation and bring it somewhere else? Not just going in trying to take the conversation out of the community. So staying and meeting the community where they are prior to me trying to throw the journalism aspect in there. That's really how I get a lot of love. Uh, how, so how has how have people responded to you um, since you started this process? How do people respond to you in the street when you walk up? And how do people respond now that you're one year in? Uh, definitely depends on topic. <laughs> I would definitely <laughs> say that depending on topic and depending on location. Um, I definitely have had ups and downs um, with certain topics and cer certain locations here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, but that was also due to lack of experience on my own. You know, I haven't necessarily went in those type, different type of communities to get answers, you know, like a written house square um, and, and just walk in and, and talk to those people who live down there. So um, I had to get out of my comfort zone and then also understand that Philadelphia isn't just West Philly. It just isn't, you know, uh, North Philly is Northern liberties as well. Mm -hmm. So going mm -hmm. into those pockets and understanding the different communities. So I have had ups and downs, but like I said, Chris has helped me, you know, throwing a little bit of advice out there here and there to get me back um, and creating the dope content that I'm creating. <laughs> Yep, yep, to the yep, yep. You already know what time it is. It's your girl, POC. I'm back in these Philadelphia streets speaking with community residents asking with record-breaking numbers with homicides here in the city of Philadelphia, an alternative local newspaper, Philadelphia Weekly, asked readers to guess what the murder rate will be between now and November 2nd, the day when residents head back to the polls for the general election for the district attorney. Whoever comes close will win street swag from the Philadelphia Weekly. So I hit the Philadelphia streets to ask Philadelphia residents are they mad or not? W-H-Y-Y. -Y. You know, Eric, what, the, the advice was really rooted in my career in sales. You know, a lot of you know, few people mm -hmm. know that before I got into journalism, I was a sales guy, man. And I was the sales guy from like your quintessential movies like Boiler Room, you know, <laughs> where, where if people were like, yo, uh, I want to take a minute to let me let me talk to my wife about this. And I would go, well, you know, if she controls the household. OK, I understand. <laughs> let me call. What time she see? Like, it, but it's always this about like, look, just talk to people. The worst thing they could say is no. And the only reason they say no is because you didn't give them enough information to say okay. yes, right? And so, like, I just, it, it was the same way when I was doing journalism on the street. It's like, you just walk up to people. You say, you know, hey, man, what's going on? How you doing? Well, I listen, did you hear about blah, 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 blah? Well, yeah, man. Well, you know what, blah, blah, blah. You get in a conversation. You say, well, listen, I'm working on the story about this. Can I get a couple seconds of audio from you? All right, yeah, yeah. Because now you've already enjoyed talking to me, right? And you don't want to be drawn. You want to actually be like, all right, all right, you know, this was this was good. This was good. But to your point, Eric, I think what POC is is doing, and we've even heard from members of Nice. I, I won't, you know, name them, but there are people who, within our cohort and outside of our cohort, who want to be able to do that kind of, you know, um, assertive you know, journalism, that's, that's what I call it, you know, assertive yeah. journalism, where you're just literally walking up to people on yes. the street. Those men on the street interviews are really, really tough. Yeah, yeah it's a skill set. It's definitely a skill set that has to be honed over time, just as POC, as you were saying. Um, and I think that it's something that's not instinctive, right? As, you know, as regular residents and citizens, we have a hesitancy. We're taught not to invade other people's space or not to approach strangers or right? Stranger danger, right? <laughs> but the reality is you got to overcome so much of that training to recognize that people are people, people mm -hmm. are human beings. And I think that's the thing that I love about Matt and all in all of your segments that you do is that you really connect with people on a human level. So mm -hmm. I'm, if I can just throw one more thing in there, um, the icing on the cake is that I started this in a pandemic, right? So mm. walking up to people is not just mm. walking up and they're seeing my beautiful face. They're seeing a mask. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm talking through the, I'm talking to them through the mask. They're my first, you know, 
first thing they see is me walking up with a mask, excuse me, can I ask you a question? So that also sometimes is a little blowback. And then people not being able to hear me through the mask. So, and then me not being able to hear them through the mic through the mask. So that was also um, a trial that I had to play with a little bit in order to get better quality sound through the mask. And then also for me to learn, learn my octaves when I'm walking to how loud can I be? How soft can I be? Um, when I'm approaching you know, older folks, the older generation, do I speak louder or do I come off in a soft voice? Because they're like, why are you yelling at me? You know, like I got that before. And I'm like, well, I, I, th I thought you couldn't hear me through the mask. Like, no, I can hear fine, <laughs> you know? So just learning how to do those things too, as well through the pandemic um, also was a good test for me. I, I think that's, that's profound in the sense that, you know, I think a lot of people, and rightfully so, 2020 was a really tough year. Um, businesses closed, people lost their jobs, people went hungry, um, and those stories deserve to be talked about. But I, I don't think that we also talk enough about the people who thrived and created and collaborated during the pandemic. Throughout history, you know, uh, I know Eric knows this, throughout history, any big crisis birthed innovation. Oh. You look at the 1920s uh, depression, like people were forced to create and collaborate and, and do these things. And so I, I, when you're talking about POC, about walking up to strangers in, in, in the middle of a pandemic, I never quite thought about and took into consideration. <laughs> but I mean, Eric and I have talked about just the idea of we launched NICE, mm -hmm. really, in the pandemic. We launched a concept that's about collaboration and coming together during a time where you can't see each other. You know, that's incredibly difficult, you know. Uh, and, and so it's interesting to see. You make it look the, easy. <laughs> you gotta make it look easy. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you don't see the blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is part of why we're doing this, is to really like pull back and talk about the challenges because you know, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, nice is one of those things that's not just captivating Philadelphia, it's captivating the country. People are looking at this model and going, if this works, this changes the game. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't change the game for Philly. It changes the game. Mm -hmm. No pressure, Eric. <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> PLC. <laughs> I'm excited, though. I, I'm, like, I'm super excited about the yeah. collaboration piece because I, I strongly believe that it's collaboration over competition, you know. Mm. And, you know, a lot of my nice partners, including myself, we're covering similar stories. We're covering similar locations here in the city of Philadelphia. So being able to do that together and, and make it bigger is the whole purpose, you know, and to get us to the point where, you know, we can be the ones that's reached out like hey we want to make sure that we get you in the building when this story is breaking so yes i'm super excited for everything that nice has to really as far as rolling out for people who are a part of it yeah i want to um highlight something that you just said because the reality is yes a lot of the partners are covering covering the same or similar stories but the thing that's great about nice and the thing that we really love about you and all the partners is that you all have your own style you have your mm -hmm. own voice mm -hmm. Right. And so there's a different perspective and a way of telling stories. So the fact that each of you have your own lane, you have your own style and flavor, just putting someone like you and Emma Restrepo from Dos Puntos, putting the two of you together is just an amazing combination. Like, and so all of the partners create this kind of synergy. Awesome. And it goes back to what you were saying about your pitch to WHYY. Like, you don't have to change yourselves, you don't have to change your voice. You don't have to change your style to fit in with anybody because the thing that we love about you and all the partners and the reason why NICE was created is because y'all are doing what you do and there's nobody else that can do it. And so that's why I just want to- That's a compliment. That. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest, man. I just wish NICE was around when I was on the ground doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because the struggle was real, you know, um, and, and, it, and it is very isolating. Um, it, it can be very um, a strain on finances, um, but at the same time, man, it teaches you grit. And, and um, I don't think I'd be where I was if it wasn't for the grassroots and all the best practices and lessons and connections mm -hmm. you learn when you're doing in the grassroots and the trust, you know, the trust building. I guess, you know, I guess that was one of the things I wanted to get to, too, mm -hmm. is, you know, with NICE, the, the whole kind of mutual aid concept is not just, you know, let me put you on and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, you know, we're offering, you know, skills, trainings, opportunities, and you're offering us connections, wisdoms, insight, and particularly around trust building. That's something Eric and I and everyone at the virtual I actually spends a lot of time talking about. Do, what's your philosophy in terms of building trust 
not, not just in your neighborhood of West Philly, but when you go out in other places, like how do you think about building trust as an independent uh, media maker? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, one thing that I make sure as far as building trust, I go along the lines of, like I said, meeting people where they are and starting those conversations there. So like I said, in the example of pretty much not taking the conversation out of the community before I'm even part of the conversation that's in the community. So that's how I'm building trust, being there, being at the events, being a part of different organizations, making sure that when I'm asking for a connection, that I'm also returning a connection as well, mm. not just taking from the socket and, and you know, just using up all the power but also giving some back to it as well so that's really how i've been building trust and then also showing up that's mm-hmm. one of the biggest mm-hmm. things about revive if you you know if you're on the streets and you you're hearing anything about yo that poc she's everywhere revive mm-hmm. is everywhere we're she's going to be somewhere so getting that you know that ear to the street that street talk you know for you if the streets are talking for you you can sit back and relax a little bit you know so <laughs> that's that's really you know the 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 vibe that we're going off as far as catching the wave of, of trusting um mm-hmm. our supporters and our supporters trusting us as well how does that resonate with you eric because when i was doing the grassroots there were times where like for me you know there's the old saying success is is 90 showing up right and there were there were events where I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna get a story out of this, but I'm going because I want people to see my face. I want them to recognize me. So when I do ask for a story, they go, this guy is always here on his bike with his hat backwards, with his phone out. And, and you just got to trust the guy who just keeps showing up. And that's, that's why it's not shocking to see you on the side of a bus right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's not shocking because you really was doing it. I can vouch for that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, 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 that shows you the progress, right? That shows you that it does pay off and that and that approach actually um, elicits rewards, right? And mm-hmm. so the thing about community is we have to be in commune with one another. Like that's the mm-hmm. root of the word. So being in connection with other people, being out in the streets, walking your neighborhood, talking to folks that you see on the corner on a regular basis, people, mm-hmm. shop owners, like all of that build, all of that builds a level of trust because first of all, people see you. They don't have to necessarily talk to you, but it's just like that that saying that your mom your mom used to tell you when you was a little kid, like there's always somebody watching you, even mm. when you don't know they're watching you. The same thing applies to the community. People know when you're present. They know when you're out and about in the streets. And they, they know, in a way, they kind of know your reputation before you even open your mouth sometimes. But the reality is that you still have to put in the work and you still have to build those one-on-one relationships. And that for me, that's the thing that I love about NICE and what I think is so brilliant about um, the fact that Chris, Sandy, and the whole idea behind NICE, you know, bringing on somebody who is not a journalist, but community engagement and community outreach at the heart mm-hmm. understands that. And I, 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 that brings me back to POC and just understanding where does this love for the community come from and, and with you and your desire to like reach out to, to folks and find out if they're mad or not. Where does that come from? Um, I, I have really where it came from, it's just pure spirit. Um, I'm truly driven by what I love to do. I, I really love, you know, broadcasting. I really love radio. I really love, you know, talking on the mic. I really do enjoy having the mic in my hand. So that's really where it came from. Um, but to get into the spirit of matter not to really want to know what the community has going on and what their thoughts and their ideas um, really came about was really, like I said, uh, after the untimely death of George Floyd, it really just, I was like, I have to, you know, really make sure that the people in the community voices are being told, I mean, heard, I'm sorry, and their stories are being told. Uh, and, and when we got that first one and the, the responses from the people in the in Philadelphia alone, I was like, oh, we have to do more. We have to do more. And then I started a series called Breaking the Cycle on the Cycle, where I would be riding around my bike and riding the city, riding around the city on my bike and having conversations with people on my bike. And that even, you know, exploded in different ways. So just really having content coming from Philadelphia, um, it's, it's an amazing city. Like it's really a city where people on the outskirts are just like, really eager to know what's happening. I don't know what Philly has, you know, <laughs> what Philly has going on, but people on the outskirts really truly just want to know about the city so much. Is there any segment that really stands out for you? I mean, we, we, I, you, you, you recently published your most recent one, which was about Philadelphia Weekly launching this ridiculous contest about gun violence. Yeah. Um, and I think that was number 16. 
in 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 the um in the uh the, the roster i guess for lack of better words of, of yeah. the segments which has been which has been your favorite i mean is there one segment that stands out more than the others um, or one topic i should say i would definitely go with the trash okay because the responses were really raw. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm mad. Why would I not be mad? You know, like, what? yeah, like, I'm pissed to the max. Like, those kind of responses. And that was early on in the pandemic when the yeah. city just wasn't picking up trash. Exactly. But that was the concept of Matter Not. Nah. You know, that mm. was the, the, the real, the raw. And I was able to blend it together with people from different parts of the city. And they were feeling the exact same way. You know, and now when when you when with that, like I said, with different topics, because like for example, um, the one where we did with the police and the firefighters not necessarily getting the vaccine, they're skipping. Mm-hmm. The vaccine. Some people were like, "Yeah, it's their choice. If they don't want to get it, they don't want to get it." And then some people were like, uh, "You know, they're the first responders, so they should get it." But it's really still up to them. So it's not necessarily a concrete answer. It's more of a yeah maybe i think so but when it came down to like the trash when it comes down to anything of uh, donald trump saying uh what he <laughs> said bad things happen in philadelphia like those things it's like oh we're at his neck you know it, so it's just getting those type of response and then actually hearing philadelphia language being used in the uh conversation as well in different topics like when people say john or he's drawn <laughs> or something like that I, I truly enjoy when you know philadelphians really get that you know that that good energy off so those two topics i would say were um really great because i got philly conversation mm. philly language in those yeah yeah I, I remember one of my um one of my friends who's a a, a news a radio executive and um and she hit me up and was like I was you know I listen to 90.9 FM when I'm not at my station when I'm driving she <laughs> said and I heard this segment and she says I thought I was listening to Power 99 she says I had to do a <laughs> double look at the radio and goes that's not what that typically sounds like and so um you know for a station to go you know I'm about to do what I do to Eric you know which is this kind of putting a mirror in front of you you know when you come in a uh, with less than a year and help reshape a 60 year old institution and the fourth largest media market in the country. Do you, does that, does that, do you understand that? Do you appreciate that? Does that like, do you reflect on that? As you just said that I got butterflies. I <laughs> I can't I tell you, like I said, I love what I do and to be a part of something, to be invited, you know, to, to sit at a table, to be a part of something like this is amazing for me. You know, this is, everything that I've been wanting for my brand revive and then Mm. also being able to do it with like-minded folks like you and Eric and everyone that's you know in the nice uh partnership is is really incredible so yeah it gives me butterflies it makes me want to fly and keep going (laughs) (laughs) how has uh nice changed your life I mean I know when you came on Eric took an intake process and needs assessment with everybody you know what what needs have you expressed that you feel have been met so far and and how has it changed your life I mean everything from you getting, you know, access to the, the mayor's schedule and, and other <laughs> things like that. Like, yes. Give our audience a little peek behind that. Um, nice has changed my life in, in a lot of ways over the past years. You know, um, I've done newspaper interviews because of it. I have uh, met so many different people who now want to see how we can collaborate to make something, you know, different from what Matter Not has to offer, but still getting the, the street uh, grit and, and, mm-hmm. and, and a conversation going. And then also just... Uh, understanding the relationships that NICE has brought me. Like, for example, Northwest, uh, the, the, the newspaper here, because they're changing their name, so I don't want to keep throwing them out there as Northwest. <laughs> but Northwest, uh, local, uh, they're part of the NICE initiative as well. And what we're doing together is amazing. They reached out and they're like, yo, we want to take Matter Now and we want to transcribe it every time you drop one. And we want to put it in our, in our newspaper. Mm. And they literally have put it in their newspapers. So I've seen matter now transcribed and now it's in print you know so just that feeling alone and that's coming from a partner that you connected me with you Mm -hmm. know so just that feeling alone once again just gives me butterflies so Mm -hmm. it went from 
an audio to now print mm-hmm, and just mm-hmm. where else would it go? So just really excited. Uh, so yes, it has changed my life in a lot of different ways. You getting butterflies over there too, Eric? <laughs> no, no, I want to, I want you to tell us a little bit about Jim McMillan. I heard you connected with oh, him. Oh yes, Jim. Yes, Jim. He's amazing. I'll leave that out. <laughs> yes, shout out to Jim. He connected me with Philadelphia uh, Community College and I'll be working with their criminal justice uh, department, who, a professor there who will be connecting me with her students and we'll be doing a series on gun violence here in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, we will be what? doing Yeah, we'll be doing this a is part- breaking news. This is <laughs> first time we've been hearing about it. <laughs> so part of the series we'll be talking about people who were affected by gun violence and then part of the series we'll be talking about solutions and how the young community is true um, at the face of it and how they want to be a part of conversations. Like they're speaking directly to um, local officials. They're speaking directly to uh, first responders. They're saying what they need to say that they typically wouldn't say because they don't have, you know, Mm -hmm. the the voice to get in the room to meet with these people. So it's going to be a conversation speaking directly towards them. And then the other half will be talking about how it's affecting them. And I think for just for our audience, Jim McMillan is the director of the Center for Better Gun Violence Reporting. He's a former um, reporter and photographer at the Daily News and Inquirer and was somebody, Eric, that you recruited for the professional development discussions. I assume that's how how y'all connected. Yes, definitely how it came out. That's definitely how that came out. Um, So I'm really excited about this. And Jim is an amazing, amazing guy. I actually have a call with him later this evening, but he's an amazing guy as far as just what he wants to do for the community of Philadelphia Mm -hmm. and what he wants to do for the reporting for the community of Philadelphia. Um, So the fact that uh, we are on an independent grassroots level, he's so excited about it because we can do so much. Um, So that's where the partnership is coming from. So I'm really excited to see what the series comes about and what the students have to say. Speaking of partnerships, is there any partner within NICE that's like a dream collaboration or one that you're like working towards that this is like somebody you didn't think, I didn't know this person was out there. I didn't know this person was doing this. We could make magic together. Nora, Nora, um, I'm not sure of the, the actual title she has, but Nora, she really stood out to me. And um, I think it was two conversations ago on our on our Friday meetings um, and just the passion that she had um, surrounding the conversation. Uh, can I bring that up? Is that mm-hmm. a, okay? <laughs> Surrounding Palestinians and everything like that, and I was just uh, really intrigued by her calmness, her stillness, and mm-hmm. how she still was able to deliver her message at the same time. Um, and that that was something that I'm like, yo, I need to figure out how I can speak to her and how we mm-hmm. can get some content going. Um, so Nora is definitely on my list as far as seeing the next person I want to collaborate with. Eric, who's Nora? For, I was going to say for the yeah. audience, uh, Nora is Nora El Marzuki. She is the publisher and lead editor of Friends, Peace, and Sanctuary Journal, the only Arabic language newspaper in the region. Why'd you, why'd you even bring them on? I mean, that's, that's a really niche publication. Why did I bring them on as part of NICE? Yeah, like how'd you I find mean, them? You know, one of the things about NICE is that we are, one, trying to elevate folks, the communities who are normally left out of the conversation. So just like what Pac just said, about the issues that have just risen up in the news and have been ongoing for decades between Israel and Palestine, understanding that oftentimes we don't get direct information from what's going on overseas in that area. Mm -hmm. And by Friends Peace and Sanctuary Journal, one, starting off, I mean, just the name alone and Mm -hmm. shows a collaborative mindset. And it started off as an an arts uh, effort um, through a few other organizations a few years ago. They just started publishing, again, at the height of the pandemic, right? Understanding that their objective was to reach a, a very niche community that's often overlooked. I thought mm-hmm. it was uh, an opportune uh, chance for us to bring this audience and this publication into NICE to help elevate what they're doing and um, and broaden their audience and introduce what their stories are to WHYY's audience. So it just seemed like a natural fit for me. Very cool. Very excited about it. Are you excited about a a potential collaboration between Revive and and the Journal? I'm excited about all the collaborations. (laughs) I'm here for all the things. Good answer, good answer. And I want to say like, yo, so POC has really been on it in terms of jumping on the opportunities to collaborate. Some mm-hmm. of them have taken off quickly. Some of them need a little, little work, right? But the reality is that this is what happens when legacy media organizations open up the doors and invite the community to co-create, right? Mm-hmm. You have all mm-hmm. of these amazing ideas that come out 
and come together and we start hearing stories and nuances that we haven't heard before. So honestly, I'm just really trying to encourage and, and excited for all the partners to get together and all the different combinations, right? I mean, mm -hmm. got, right now we have 12 people, we're gonna be bringing on more, but just think about all the different combinations that can happen between just, just those 12 alone. I mean, I don't, I'm not one for, you know, mathematics and can't figure out the, the, the number of permutations of all of that, the calculations that'll come out of that. But the reality is that there's, it's ripe for some really exciting um, content and um, mm -hmm. POC is, is evidence of that. Yeah. What, what you said is right too, about opening the doors and allowing the people to co-create. That's kind of what you and I talked about with the idea that the future of journalism is people. Right. The future of journalism is bringing people together and helping them influence what that future should be. And so in our last few minutes, I wanted to kind of focus on that. You know, Eric and I have kind of shared our thoughts on that. But, you know, POC, when you think about the future of journalism, what do you think about and, and what role do you want to play in it? Um, the future of journalism is, is definitely going to be very innovative and very colorful. Um, mm. I feel like the future of journalism is going to open up to a wide, bright rainbow. And when I say that is because we are on the brink of making sure that everything is diversified. Everything has some type of something involved in it, some community involved in some aspect, some way, shape or form. So it wouldn't be typical old fashioned media. You know, it wouldn't be the white guy in the suit with his hair pushed back. You know, you might see <laughs> a black woman with a bun. You might see a black woman with some dredge, a black man, you know, with a t-shirt that's saying mm. black lives matter on the five o'clock news. Um, you might even see the LGBT community come in and, and have their own reporting on their communities and highlighting different things of that nature. Um, you might see more Asian faces coming through. Um, I just see a big colorful rainbow and everyone being a, a part of the rainbow and getting a piece of the pie as well, you know, the American dream. <laughs> um, so when it comes to, to actually telling the American dream and what's happening throughout the days of the dream, as everyone is dreaming, I really feel like the media industry is going to have to uh, propel itself forward Mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to even be seen um, in the way of technology because you have social media now, right? And social media for the next generation is the first thing they're going to, to check for stories and check for trendings and check for what's current right now. So if the news itself, like uh, cable television news, like Fox 5, MSNBC, CNN, don't keep up with you know social media, they're definitely gonna le be left behind the curve. And then also having our shows are no longer gonna be a thing either. You're going to have to literally snip it down to a 15 minute segment eventually because people time frames are not even there no more. Um, and then it's going to have to be a lot of video um, tours mm. as well. You're going to have to put a lot of um, pictures with it. It's not going to be just storytelling. You're going to have to tell the story with a video or something of that nature. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the, the future of um, media, I really feel like it's going to open up uh, an array of doors for a lot of people. So the future of journalism is diverse, mm -hmm. it's multimedia, it's, it's grassroots, it's, community it's, friendly. it's nice. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, definitely, Got it. definitely, definitely. Um, and then my part um, is just as far as seeing me in, in the future of media, I never really thought about that question until right mm. now, but where I see myself as the future of media, I've always dreamt about, you know, doing something as big as Kathy Hughes, um, being able to have my voice on so many different stations at one time, um, being able to really get on to um, syndicated radio and, and mm -hmm. taking off, um, you know, with having some type of W in front of it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that doing something as similar or as big as Kathy Hughes, that's always been a dream of mine, but it always throwing that Ida B. Well punch in there at the mm -hmm. same time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good dream. And, and Eric, I think she's in the right place because, I mean, WHOY is part of hundreds of radio stations around the country. Right. And, and so th I think that this is just the beginning. Eric, your last thoughts before we jump out of here? No, I think uh, what POC said is, is sums it up. Um, what we are doing here is really about 
I don't want to oversell nice and say that mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're making dreams possible. But again, we're we're starting the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Asking those questions to elicit the thought and make people think beyond what they've already been doing. How can we think beyond what's already happened and create a new future um, that centers people, centers their humanity and centers the, the stories that they tell? So POC, you are doing that on, on all burners at Thank this you. point. So really appreciate you. If I could just throw one thing in there too as well. I just recently did um, a car talk. Have you guys ever heard of car talk show? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just recently did a car talk show and he invited me on because he wanted to learn more about uh, Matter Not, WHYY and the NICE initiative. And just knowing that that particular audience were, you know, they were engaged, they wanted to know more was exciting to me. People who are interested in cars want to like, literally listen to what Matt or not has to offer, but then I thought about it. They're listening to it on their radio mm. in cars and that's mm -hmm. why they want to know more about it. So that's what I mean when I say that media is going to shift. Like you are literally interviewing a person in the vehicle as we're riding around seeing, uh, you know, sightseeing Philadelphia and seeing attractions that Philadelphia has to offer. Um, I think that that's more engaging as well, because as we're at red lights, we're reaching out, we're saying, hey, how are you? you know, uh, shout this person out, shout this out. And that was also engaging uh, with the community because they wanted to learn more while they were at the red light. So just seeing the innovation of that um, as well, I just wanted to open up the door to say it's, it's different platforms now of how you can deliver your message and your content. So now you've you've just totally blew my mind. And <laughs> are you talk, when you say talk, car talk, are you talking about the original Tapper Brothers car oh, talk? No. <laughs> been around for like no, I wish one day, but no. Is so that, I was going to say, is that a continuation of that series? Because they've been no. around like, I know one of them just passed, but. No, I wish. Car Talk with Josh. He's a um, a small uh, entity <laughs> here in the city of Philadelphia. All right. All right. We might want to talk to Josh about rebranding that. But, but <laughs> okay. all right, I got excited for him. I was like, I got brothers. <laughs> well, POC. Congratulations on one Thank year. You. Here's to Thank another you. year and many yes. more. Yes. Um, you can follow her on Twitter at revive underscore POC. I would tell you to follow Eric, but Eric don't tweet. <laughs> you don't tell, you don't I retweet. I retweet. retweet. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is this was dope. I appreciate the community that was building. I appreciate you guys so much. Um, and this is just the beginning. So thank you. And thank you guys for watching. We're out. Yes.